All right, Judge Rosen, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for joining me. It's been quite a week for you. You walked out of the courthouse for the last time this week. I did, Tuesday, after 27 years. <laughs> what was that like? Bittersweet. It was hard. Uh, you know, the court is like a family, uh, and uh, I, I had very strong attachment to the institution and to my colleagues and to the staff. Uh, it was hard. You know, I think it's interesting because so many times we talk about judges or we see you presiding over cases and mm -hmm. we never really get to do those in-depth conversations with you about what you thought about some of the cases that you had to preside over. Right. So when we had talked uh, about the fact that you were retiring um, and so many interesting things that you've been able to decide on mm -hmm. and preside over, I want you to take a step back and, of course, so many people know you from your decision-making in the grand bargain around mm -hmm. Detroit's bankruptcy, but you've also covered so many other cases. What stands out to you as you reflect now in retirement of some of the largest cases and that touched you? Well, I, th I think some of the more far-reaching cases were I had a very early partial birth abortion case in which I uh, ultimately struck down the state statute on partial birth abortion, which probably disappointed some of my Republican friends. You know, I was appointed by a Republican president, but uh, the medicine sort of drove the law on that. And once I understood the medicine, which was not easy. I always tell people that uh, I can explain in two words why I went to law school, organic chemistry, but I hired a uh, court-appointed expert to help me understand the medicine. And once I understood the medicine, uh, it was pretty clear to me that the statute had to fall. So there was that. And then uh, just before that, I had one of the very first physician-assisted suicide cases. And I think I was the first judge in the country to uh, hold that there was no constitutional right under either the Equal Protection or Due Process Clauses to physician-assisted suicide, a decision that was ultimately uh, affirmed by the Supreme Court, although not in my case. My case didn't go up on appeal that far. But uh, so I had, I had an early case on the casino gambling, you may remember, Don Barden mm -hmm. sued uh, to overturn the statutes. I found that the casino ordinances were constitutional. But probably the case that I was most known for was the so-called sleeper cell case, which was the first post 9-11 uh, terrorism trial uh, that went to went to verdict. Uh, three of the four young men were convicted and uh, not long before I was going to sentence them I received information that the prosecutors had withheld exculpatory evidence, which is a constitutional violation. And uh, I ordered an investigation, of what we call a full file investigation. The Attorney General of the United States appointed uh, a special counsel to investigate. I thought that the investigation would take a month or two, ended up taking almost 10 months. Uh, I ended up going out to the CIA for three days to review highly classified information. Uh, I think I'm still the only judge in history to have actually gone to the CIA and looked at highly classified information. And when you deal with those kinds of cases, again, we don't usually get to hear the personal side of yeah. what the judge feels. What were some of the thoughts that were going through your mind, especially on that terrorism case? Uh, you know, I, I always show great deference to jury verdicts. Uh, under In our system, Christy, the jury is the fact finder. And uh, this particular jury put a lot of work into that case. But uh, on the other hand, I'm sworn to uphold the Constitution. That's my job. And once I received the information, uh, I, I, I had to follow it and ultimately overturned the verdicts. And, you know, I received a lot of criticism for that. You might remember that this, by the time we got to the investigation piece of it, uh, this was against the backdrop of the 2004 election in which the biggest issue that President Bush was running against Senator Kerry on was uh, terrorism. Mm -hmm. And uh, we ended up overturning the verdicts just before the election, so that got a lot of attention. But, you know, I, I, I've, I've always felt that the role of the judge is to kind of, to the greatest extent you possibly can, and ignore the incoming mm -hmm. <laughs> anti-aircraft stuff, uh, the flak, and keep your keep yourself focused on the finish line and what the law is and let the law and the evidence take you there and try to do that as best I could. And the rest uh, the rest just comes with it. I mean, I had a couple of death threats during that case. 
uh, which were distracting. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a young child uh, at the time, and that's, as a judge, you, you know, that's really your most vulnerable point, your, your child. So that was distracting, but... Those sort of comes with you, that you look back comes with the territory. Comes with the territory. Bit. So you've seen, um, and you've been in Detroit, and so you've seen mm. the area change. Uh, you've seen the rise. You've seen the fall, and then you get the case of the mediation of Detroit's bankruptcy, which people know you for mm. mostly um, in talking about the grand bargain and you're helping craft that deal, which is historic in nature. Tell us a little bit about how that first came to be, and I know that it's a bit of a complicated story and a long one, but how did the Grand Bargain first come to be, and where were those first conversations? Uh, I think we have to start with what my role in the bankruptcy was. I was not the judge. Uh, I was, as you said, the chief mediator. So I often tell people that Steve Rhodes, the bankruptcy judge, had the front room, I had the back room. My job was to get deals and to try to get the bankruptcy through to the finish line as expeditiously as we could because, uh, you know, time was really Detroit's enemy. Nothing was going to improve with time, and the only way to, to do this expeditiously was through consensual deals. The greatest challenge was that Detroit didn't have any assets. 42% uh, of all of its revenues were committed to legacy cost, pensions, and health care largely, but that number was going to rise within four years to 67 percent. And in terms of actual assets that could be monetized into revenue to pay creditors, uh, there was nothing, <laughs> very, very, very little, uh, except for one thing, uh, the art. <laughs> the uh, world-renowned, uh, iconic collection at the Detroit Institute of Arts. and. If you remember back then, uh, the media and observers were talking about um, they were talking about monetizing the art, which meant liquidating it, and all of the creditors wanted to liquidate it. Uh, I thought that would be a, a, a terrible idea. Detroit had been cannibalizing its heritage to mortgage its future for decades, and this would just be another one-time payment, which wouldn't address the underlying problems. But on the other hand, I was concerned about the retirees. Uh, here were people who had given their working lives to the city. Police officers, firefighters, uh, garbage collectors, um, people who worked in the accounting department. You know, all of the clerical people. And I was very concerned, uh, Kevin Orr, the emergency manager, was talking about cutting their pensions by 50%. Mm -hmm. And I was very concerned about what that would mean for the region. So, so I had to were, figure out how to balance in a, You were in a, in a tough position with yeah. not a lot of options and in the role of being chief arm twister as well. Right. That's, that was my role. <laughs> so how did you come up or where did the idea come from? Well, I was doing a lot of reading. I was actually on a golf vacation, long planned with my son. Uh, he was 15 then. And I was getting up very early. I'd brought a lot of reading down to Florida, sitting in a little condo. And the more I read, and then I, I was talking to all the parties, the lawyers, uh, and the more I read and the more I talked to the parties, it just seemed to me that the bankruptcy was bookended by uh, two things principally. The art on the one hand and the pensions on the other. And that if somehow, and the media was presenting this, uh, and the parties were presenting this as a binary choice, one or the other. Uh, I, I tried to think of it that maybe there was a way we could tie them together and not make it a binary choice. So one morning I got up and I had this idea and I had a legal pad in front of me, actually the cardboard backing of the legal pad, and I'm a, I'm a doodler, and I just doodled this little idea. Uh, in one circle I put state because I thought the state could kickstart the funding, in another circle I put art, in another circle I put pensions and I drew uh, arrows with dollar signs from the state to the art to the pensions and then I drew a box around the art to indicate we'd lock off the art from all of the other creditors and then an arrow to the pensions to indicate we'd give all of the proceeds. And I'd talk to my old friend Rick Snyder about kickstarting the funding and uh, that was really the beginning of it. Rick wasn't buying into that at first. At first, so this was this the beginning conversations, <laughs> yeah. but then you had to go to foundations I as did. well. Yeah. Miriam Nolan, who you know, uh, I, I ran into her at the deli across the street from the courthouse. She asked, she offered to help, and I, I said, funny you should ask, and I spun out this idea, um, and uh, 
She was amazing. She brought in 13, the heads of 13 foundations. We had a meeting November 5th of 2013, and within a month, the foundation started committing in, in a very big way. We got, so did that then change the governor's mind? It did. Yeah, we got to $291 million, and I went back up to see the governor, and I made a strong a, a strong pitch to him because the foundation's commitments were conditional upon the state participating. And I, I, I said to him, I said, Rick, you know, this is an assetless bankruptcy. Um, we can't leave this money on the sidelines. If we do, invariably this will become public and we will all be weighed by history in the balance and found wanting. And uh, we've got to find a way to do this. And to the governor's great credit, he, you know, this was not a popular thing. Uh, you know, the Tea Party had significant influence and they were very much against this, but the governor agreed there was, there was a sort of an aha moment in which uh, he asked me several questions because I, I, was, I had a tally sheet with me, which is along with the doodle it's now hanging in the DIA, uh, and he asked me how much I, think, I thought we would get to. I wasn't sure, but I thought we'd, with a number of outstanding foundations, I thought we'd get to 350 million. We actually got, ended up with 370 from the foundations. And uh, he said, what do you think? the state should do and I said I think you've got to match them and uh, he then asked me he sort of asked me the penultimate question which was do you think it'll be enough he said you can't come back and retrade me on this we're only going to get one shot at this going one to the shot. legislature and uh, that was a hard question because you know we weren't getting any movement from the retirees but I thought if we could get 350 from the state and 350 from the foundations, we'd probably have to raise some money from the DIA and private donors. I, I, and I said, I think if we get to 800 million, we'll make it work. He reached across, we shook hands, and that was it. Do you think that you did the best that you could for the city of Detroit? Yes. It was a tough situation. You know, it was a crisis. Uh, I felt very strongly that we had to get through the bankruptcy through consensual deals. The best way to get through the bankruptcy through consensual deals was to get the largest creditor, the retirees, with their pensions and health care uh, at, at, at almost nine and a half million, a billion dollars. If we got them off the runway, then we could deal with the financial creditors who had the rest of the debt, which is how it played out. And, uh, you know, we did it in 16 months, uh, which is warp speed in the municipal bankruptcy space. Uh, in fact, Every city that was in bankruptcy when we started was still in bankruptcy when we finished. Do you have other people now coming to you saying, how, how did you do this and can we duplicate this in some way? Do you ever think the grand bargain could be duplicated in other cities that have financial yeah. issues or is that this is just such a unique case? Well, I think this is a terrific challenge for cities around the country and territories like Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands who are facing their own crisis. Um, you know, Hollywood continues to make these sort of fantastical movies about tsunamis washing over cities. Uh, the real tsunami hitting cities, major cities, is the, uh, is the legacy debt and the municipal finance debt. It's certain, Detroit was just the canary in the coal mine. So I, I guess I would answer it this way. Uh, every city, and I am getting calls, mm -hmm. uh, every city is going to have to find its own grand bargain. I, I think for each city, it's probably there. It, they, they don't have an art museum. They'll have to find other assets that mean a lot to the region uh, that can be monetized without, uh, without destroying them. I was in Puerto Rico uh, a couple weeks ago and meeting with some of the leaders there. Um, but the, step one is there has to be the political will. We were very fortunate in Detroit that we had a lot of political will behind this. We had the governor the emergency manager, Kevin Orr, and the mayor when he came into office in January of 2014. Uh, and all of them were committed to restructuring the underlying foundations of Detroit's debt. And that was really important. So every time that you and I have talked, I've always said, so when's the book coming out about <laughs> this? Um, have you written a book? I have, yeah. I finished a draft. I sent it off to my agents. I have two agents. I have a book agent in New York and a book to film agent in Hollywood. Uh, this is a different world for me, mm -hmm. <laughs> not a world I'm used to, and you know the scales are sort of coming away from my eyes. Uh, 
But uh, I finished the draft about a month ago, a month and a half ago, mm -hmm. and my agents are working on it. Uh, they've got a strategy, and I'm in their hands. Uh, but I'm, you know, I'll just say a, a word about this. You know, when I was going through this, it was about getting deals. Get this deal, put the grand bargain deal together, get a deal with the UTGO creditors, the LTGO creditors, the special revenue bond creditors. It was get a deal, get a deal, get a deal, head down, get to the finish line. But at two years removed now, I, I, I really think about it as a story about people, people coming together, finding common ground, planting a flag on the common ground, and uh, moving ahead uh, together to uh, save an iconic city. So maybe someday we might see a movie about this. I'm hopeful. Yeah, It's probably going to be a made-for-TV miniseries type of thing because it's such a complicated story to try to tell in an hour and a half or two hours. I know that you do have a, a second act in, in mediation. We'll get to that in just a moment. But my, one of my last questions for you would be, as you sit back now and look at the city of Detroit and where the city is headed, what are some of your thoughts about the direction the city has gone post-bankruptcy? You know, I've lived in Detroit just about my entire life, uh, with the exception of a five-year foray to Washington. I, I've been here all my life. Uh, this is the most optimistic time I can remember. We have uh, great leadership with Mike Duggan and the team he's put together. Tremendous investment coming into Detroit. Um, and uh, people seem optimistic and committed to Detroit's future in ways that I've never seen before. So I am very optimistic. In fact, my own story about uh, transitioning to the judicial arbitration and mediation services firm that we're starting with Steve Rhodes, Judge Rhodes and I are starting, and Supreme, former Supreme Court Justice Mary Beth Kelly and my old friend and partner at Miller Canfield, Rocky Poza, uh, is a story of Detroit. Uh, JAMS is the largest alternative dispute resolution provider in the world. Uh, they called me in uh, March and they asked, uh, they said they've been following what's been happening in Detroit and they wanted to be part of it and they asked if I would uh, lead the team and uh, you know I was all about helping Detroit and leading the team and I was sort of looking for my the next chapter of my life. Uh, you know F. Scott Fitzgerald said there are no second acts in American lives. I'm hoping to prove them wrong <laughs> but uh, it, it's a story about what's happening in Detroit. Uh, there are still some caution flags, uh, you know, I think the schools, although Steve did a, Steve Rhodes did a great job leading the school district for eight or nine months, put a lot of reforms into place that I hope the new governance will continue. Um, and the neighborhoods. Uh, the neighborhoods have to be a part of the revitalization. But if you look at what's coming down the road in terms of investment, uh, the blight removal program is working. It's got some challenges on the legal side, but it's working. I think the last number I saw was 11 or 12,000 lighted homes have been removed. Mm -hmm. uh, the street lights are all on. At the beginning of the bankruptcy, 40% of the 90,000 street lights were out, <laughs> and now they're all back on. Uh, these may be just small things, but they're important. We have a brand new uh, regional water and sewer system that's serving the, serving the region ter tremendously well that we did in the bankruptcy. And uh, that's going to that's going to bode very well for the not only the delivery of water and sewerage services to the region, but the relationship between the counties and the city. So I think it's all to the good. There are some caution flags, but you know we're meeting our marks on the plan of adjustment. The Financial Review Commission, uh, the city is meeting its marks, and uh, there's just uh, I think a lot of hope for optimism. Well, best of luck in Thank this uh, in this next chapter, and thanks for taking the time with us. And you'll keep thanks. us posted on the Made for TV movie, right? Yes. We don't want to have to read about it. We want to hear it from you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Judge I'll Jerry Rosen. Thanks. It's good to see you. Thanks, Christy. Great to see you. Thanks.